98 Koshin Koko Yaku Simulation was released on the PlayStation in Japan in June of 1998 and translates to 98 Koshin High School Baseball Simulation. To really understand what we're getting into today, we're going to have to take a quick dive into the world of Koshin. High school baseball in Japan is a very serious thing. It's known to be on par in terms of popularity with Japan's professional baseball league, Nippon Professional Baseball, or NPB, receiving wide television coverage on NHK and various local channels. Ambitious young players endure rigorous training to compete in an invitation tournament and a championship known as Spring Koshin and Summer Koshin, respectively. Within each of the 47 prefectures of Japan exists individual high school baseball federations that combine to make up the Japan High School Baseball Federation. Along with two major newspapers, this organization governs both main Koshin events comprised of 49 high schools narrowed down from over 4,000. It's a widely respected tradition that began back in 1915 and continues to draw huge rambunctious crowds to this day. It's fairly common to see young players pitching their shoulders out of their sockets or entire teams crying profusely, as this cultural institution is far beyond being just a pastime. It's held as sacred and oftentimes is the absolute highlight of these ballplayers' lives. The Summer Championship culminates in August as a two-week-long final tournament stage taking place at the famous Hanshin Kushin Stadium, also simply known as Kushin Stadium, near Kobe in Nishinomiya, Hyogo Prefecture. This titular stadium makes frequent appearances in different mediums across Japanese pop culture. <laughs> Wait, what is this person doing? This is uh, King of Fighters 97, by the way. What? Why? Why are they reading? <laughs> hey, what you reading for? Anyways, it's a landmark that is firmly cemented in the history of Japan and is quite the household name. Here's Babe Ruth hanging out at Kushin Stadium with some young kids during his 1934 tour of Japan. You can actually visit the stadium to see the plaque that was put up in commemoration of his visit. <laughs> The culture of Kushin should really be noted here, as there seems to be more of a militaristic focus on the team rather than the individual player. In fact, their names aren't even printed on their jerseys for this very reason. According to ESPN senior writer Chris Jones, these boys never wear names. And from a distance, as they practice their drills with alarming precision, looking less like ball players and more like a marching band, like toy soldiers, any single one of them disappears into the lockstep crowd. I don't know anything about baseball stats, but it doesn't take much to realize upon quick glance that a lot of these games are noted for high pitch counts and players pushing themselves to the absolute physical limit. This type of genuine desperation on display I think is what really appeals to people. It's fascinating to watch. The year is 1985 and Hanshin Koshin Stadium's home NPB team, the Hanshin Tigers, formerly known as the Osaka Tigers, have just won the Central League Championship, which was quite a big deal. Just around the corner from Koshin Stadium, in the very same prefecture, a game development and publishing company by the name of Home Data is incorporated. Over a period of three years, Home Data would release several noteworthy titles on the Nintendo Famicom. Their very first game was Penguin Coon Wars, which was actually ported to other regions on the Game Boy. This was followed by Sky Destroyer, Squoon, and Tetsuon Adam, aka Mighty Adam, which is part of the series known elsewhere as Astro Boy. Between 1988 and 1989, they made two arcade games. Reikai Doshi, Chinese Exorcist, translates to Spiritual Guardian, Chinese Exorcist, and I guess the cabinet was distributed to other regions as Last Apostle Puppet Show. This game is credited as being the first to use digitized sprites and motion capture animation, as well as being the first fighting game with a claymation aesthetic. Home Data would then go on to make more Famicom games, such as Tetra Star the Fighter and Cosmic Epsilon. Can we just stop and admire this cover for a minute? It is beautiful. They did World Super Tennis, known in North America as Chris Everett and Ivan Lendl in Top Players Tennis, and in PAL regions as Four Players Tennis. Now, some sources online claim that Home Data created Little League Baseball Championship Series, which was based on the same engine as Baseball Stars, but I have yet to find proof or proper citation on that. If it's true, it would help to fit certain puzzle pieces in a very roundabout way. 
You see, this game, which was only released in North America in June of 1990, and as far as we know for certain, was developed and published by SNK, seems to share certain assets with Kushin on NES. Actually, like, a lot of assets. To a T, like, they are definitely the same things being used, but the games are not the same. This is relevant because it's the first entry in the Kushin series, which the game we intend to focus on today is a part of. Though, this entry which was released in October of the previous year, 1989, was made by another company by the name of K Amusement Leasing. I looked everywhere for a solid answer, but I just couldn't find one, and these things always end up tearing open big ugly rabbit holes, so let's just move on. In 1993, Home Data changed their name to Magical Company, or Maho. According to the representative for the company, Takayuki Minosaku, this very unusual company name was named from the desire to impress its... <laughs> Wait. This very unusual company name was named from the desire to impress users. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm sure that's a translation thing. That's stupid of me to laugh at that, but <laughs> it's pretty funny on its own, though. This very unusual company name was named from the desire to impress users. <laughs> oh, man. It's like, uh, this is as straightforward as the Liberty Mutual theme song. Liberty, 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 Liberty. <laughs> Somebody got paid to write that. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, I'm sorry. Both previously as Home Data and currently within this timeline as Magical Company, the group developed and published a large number of Mahjong, Shogi, and Ego games, two of which we all know how to play now, don't we? They also developed and ported a myriad of games to the Sharp X 68000, including three games in the Gato Densetsu, or Legend of the Hungry Wolf series, which is known many places as Fatal Fury. Oh, whoops, I'm sorry. Is this image too small? Here, let me make it bigger for you. Mmm, looks pretty gross, doesn't it? Yep. That is the best representation of this game that I could find. And this leads me to a quick issue I want to bring up about the major lack of image scans for box art and manuals on the internet. Sega fans are lucky to have SegaRetro.org, but we need that kind of thorough commitment and dedication for everything else, too. There are so many games out there that haven't been properly documented, and as time moves on, these cardboard boxes and paper manuals are only going to deteriorate. I don't know much about what I can do personally at the moment, but I will take this opportunity to mention that I'll be starting a blue Bidja game Discord in hopes of bringing the community together to talk talk about these kind of things, and perhaps work towards proper scans and photos from personal collections. For example, I'd like to carefully upload scans of PS2 manuals from my collection that aren't currently available online. It's a work in progress right now, and I'll update everyone as things move on. Now back to Magical Company. Moving into the future, Magic would go on to release plenty of games on Game Boy Color, Super Famicom slash Super Nintendo, and PlayStation. Omii Commando, Bakapuru Nitsukomio, or Matchmaking Commando, Putting on Bakapul, is a futuristic game about arranged marriages. <laughs> they also released a number of PlayStation 2 games like Hard Hitter Tennis, aka Magical Sports Hard Hitter 2, aka Hard Hitter 2. 1994's Koshin 3 on the Super Famicom was the first Koshin title made by Magical. The initial two entries on Famicom and Super Famicom were made by the aforementioned K Amusement Leasing. <laughs> Under the guidance of Magical, the series quickly became a success and was noted for featuring actual high school players and teams. For the game that today's video is about, Magical pulled data from 4,129 different Japanese high schools, which in 1998 was nearly all of them. The Koshin license quickly became the poster child for Magical Company, which is why they re-released 98 Koshin in December of 2000 as a part of their budget series called Magical 1500. These titles were sold at the lowered price of 1500 yen, which is about 13 US dollars. Today, Magical Company has transitioned to... Wait, you guys all want to take a wild guess? Yep, you already know. Mobile apps! Ugh, what bleak future is in store for all of us? They also do pachinko machines, which is a thing. I guess the last Koshin game they made was in the form of a mobile game in 2016, and at that point the series had transitioned to the mobile platform over a decade earlier. Okay, let's finally get into this game.
Let's get this out of the way right now. I love this game. I love it. I was never really into sports games, but if more baseball games like this were released in the US, I would have been much more likely to play them. Aside from the obligatory mention of the opening scene intro graphics that are somewhat impressive for the system, my immediate favorite thing in this game is the music. It bounces all over the place with a slight hint of synthesized cheese, but it's great. Check out this electric drum solo. Of course, my first thing to do is laugh at the silliness of it all, but I mean it when I say that the music in this game is really good. It gets moody at times, which is my favorite thing, but also, you have stuff like this conceptual piece. It uses the sound of a photograph being taken on a camera as percussion. The song ramps up to a frantic cacophony of sounds as we feel the weight of fame and celebrity at such an early age. These are the dizzying sounds you hear as a teenage Koshian star when your whole country is watching you. You can either choose to do a full season or a quick game. Let's at least take a look at the initial portions of the season, and then we'll jump into a quick game. Remember earlier when I mentioned the thousands of high schools that data was pulled from to make this game possible? Well here they all are. You can play as every single one of them. By region and prefecture, you can choose a real high school from 1998 to play as. Could you imagine being like 16 years old and getting to play as your high school in a video game? Or geez, could you imagine getting to play as yourself? Crazy stuff for a kid that age. I love this opening portion before you jump into the baseball season. This cutie patootie talks to us for a bit underneath the cherry blossoms, and judging by the stiff flag, we can only assume that we're somewhere on the moon. On this screen, I think you are changing the names of your team or your anthem or mascot or something. I'm not sure, but check this out. I'm not exactly sure what it is that you're altering, but you place these symbols down and then mess with the pitch of each sound using these wheels. <laughs> It was really neat to see this. I love the detail on this kid's face, as well as the overall character movements. But more so than anything, I love the work put into the pre-rendered background. Look how they play with depth perception and lighting. There's a lot of thought and care put into this single room. This one image tells a story. And of course, I want to mention the Liddeller here. We have literal and figurative windows into other worlds. Taking a step into the practice field, our very pleasant friend reappears under yet another cherry blossom tree to discuss the season schedule. Again, I just want to praise the character animations. Between her emotive eyes and subtle gestures, there's more character work put into this sports title than a lot of the narrative-driven games I've seen from the era. So now it appears that she wants us to do some pitching and catching practice. We get some nice chiptune music during the loading screen, which makes me wonder if it's a callback to an earlier cushion game. And then... Whoa! This is really good! <laughs> Alright, this is great! The full body animations are so fluid and expressive. More importantly though is the overall tone being set here. This music works perfectly. It gives the whole bit this sense of youthful playfulness. Kind of reminds me of a more straightforward version of the Cardiacs. So anyways, the goal here is to learn how to throw pitches and correspondence with the green squares. It took me a minute, but I'm pretty sure the orientation translates to the face buttons. So triangle is up, square is left, X is down, and circle is right, and I noticed that left and right in the D-pad might give the pitch a bit of hook. I'm probably wrong about everything I just said, but that's what it seemed like was happening to me. There's a solid weight to each successful throw, and it feels really good. The camera then flips around, and we are doing basically the same thing as the catcher. I had some trouble with the diagonal commands, and was kicked out of practice before I could figure it out. And I'll go ahead and put this out there now. During my whole playthrough, I was never able to fully grasp the controls of this game, unfortunately. This I blame entirely on language barrier. The game is somewhat text-heavy, and I can only assume that a pretty friend has been telling us about the control all along. GameFAQs was no help at all either, so if you're a person that actually does know how to play the game, and you're watching this idiot misinform people on the controls, please enlighten us all in the comments. It would be really wonderful if this game got a fan translation, so I'm kind of hoping this project might plant some seeds to set that in motion.
We also get some batting practice, which is simple. X and square do slightly different swings, left and right move the player accordingly, and up and down adjust your swing height. Just like the pitching, hitting a ball has a certain oomph to it that feels very satisfying. And take a gander at the buildings in the background, with very odd looking clouds even further back. I love this kind of stuff. Next is base running practice, I guess. I mashed all the buttons and was finally able to figure out that you were supposed to quickly alternate between R1 and L1 to fill this meter, I think. Here I watched the team play a practice round, and it seemed like I couldn't really control anything, so I'm not sure what's going on with that. And then I experienced a bug. I think the game crashed on me or something. I got stuck on the screen and no matter how many buttons I pressed, nothing happened. The pitcher was just stuck in this endless loop as my appreciation for the song deteriorated. If I could read everything that was going on up until this point, I'd be much more inclined to stay on with the season and see what other things we could get into. But as it is, I'm confused and frustrated. So let's just jump into the quick play. You can choose between man or comp, and I really wish I could have done this two player because the AI is about to kick my butt. I really like the sounds of the announcer. I like how the crowds are all illustrated up close, but far away they're just individually colored pixels. I like the camera movements, but what do I not like? Well, <laughs> I don't like that I don't know how to play this game. I seriously have no idea how to properly field the ball, or even when I'm actually controlling different players. My guess is that you throw to each base using the corresponding face buttons, but even then I wasn't sure, and the players were never really in a hustle to get the ball where it needed to be in the time that it needed to be there. As I played, I couldn't help but feel a deep sadness about the whole thing. So much is here, but it's all locked behind miscommunication. It's tragic. The only major criticism I can properly come up with is that when you're at bat, the catcher takes up way too much screen real estate. I can never really aim for the ball properly because this guy is in the way. It's a pretty significant flaw, and I don't know how they overlooked this. I guess you could also criticize all the ads in the game for real-world products, as that usually bothers a lot of people, but to me that's pretty consistent with sports in general, so I don't know. Needless to say, they were wiping the floor with me. <laughs> I mean, look at this score. It's embarrassing. What are you celebrating? But then something crazy happened. I hit a homer! Look at that! Victory march, baby! And then something even crazier happened. The game started to turn around. It's like the morale of the players got a huge boost from the single moment of magic. And we won the game! Nah, I'm just kidding. I mean the home run did happen, but this is the final score. And just because the AI really wanted to show how inferior I was, it decided to reveal its second form and go Super Saiyan towards the end of the game by switching out pitchers to this absolute beast with a bizarre windup and equally strange curveball. So yeah, I lost the match, and then the game did a hard reset. If you play the PC version of this game, I guess there's a way to whack out your players into all these crazy animations. I don't know if that can be done in the PlayStation version, but I definitely would like to find out how to do it. I'm not sure if it's some sort of bug that you exploit, or if it's like a something that you can actually do within the game that was intended to be done, but I want to find out how to do that. I do want to reiterate the necessity of a translation for this game. If anybody out there wanted to work on it, you would be my absolute hero. I can tell that there's a lot of good in this game, but it's really quite impossible for me to enjoy it in its current state. I now want to give a very sincere thank you to the three incredible people that are my Patreon supporters. Lily, Ryan, and JC, thank you so, so very much. With your help, this project is one step closer to a reality. It humbles me so much to have people like you place faith in people like me to get this thing done, and right now my motivation is through the roof. If any of you watching want to become a part of the complete PlayStation review series by helping me quit my bartending job to focus solely on this, the link to this page Patreon is in the description below, but absolutely no pressure whatsoever. Either way, I'm just so happy to be making these videos and sharing it with all of you. It's one of the most fulfilling things I've done with myself in a long while. So I leave you with this. It's a good game, it's a sad situation, and it's your responsibility to be nice to people. Bye.